Oh, hi, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Long. I'm an immigration lawyer with Long Mango G. Um, today, what I would like to do is introduce you to my friend, Jacob Manishevitz. He is an excellent mortgage broker with Safe uh, Bridge Financial Group. Um, and the reason why I thought you guys might be interested um, to uh, get to know him is because I was talking to Jacob and he was telling me a lot of information about how people who just come to Canada can get mortgages and what is important to know about that. Because I know a lot of you are looking to get into the red hot property market in Canada. And you're wondering, um, how is it that I can actually afford this and get mortgages? So here is uh, the information that I thought might be of interest to you. Take it away, Jacob. Amazing. Thanks, Elizabeth, for having me. Very excited to present to everybody. So getting a mortgage as a new Canadian, uh, like Elizabeth said, a lot of people coming to Canada are looking to uh, get their foot in the door as far as real estate and buy that home for yourself and buy that home for your family. But there is quite a few things that you need to know before being able to move forward. Um, I'm going to talk about everything from a lending perspective. Um, so all of the uh, guidelines and stipulations that I'm talking about are really put in place by the lenders that are going to end up lending you the money that you need for the mortgage for your home. Uh, the four key factors that I wanted to talk about today um, are your status in Canada, the income that you make, your down payment, which is the money that you have saved up put, that you're going to be putting into the equity in the property, um, and credit, which is very, very important, possibly the most important aspect of your profile, um, and it's what the lender will be looking at um, very intensely when they're qualifying you for the mortgage. Um, and Elizabeth, feel free to ask, ask any questions that you have as we go along. But I will start off with your status in Canada. So I've divided it into kind of three sections here. Um, your status will really determine which um, basket that you fall into from the lending perspective. Uh, so the first one is a citizen or permanent resident in Canada. If you are uh, in this basket, you're basically in the best position to borrow um, and the lenders will allow you to have the minimum down payment, which is 5% on the first five. 500,000 if you want to get technical about it, and then 10% on any dollar above 500,000. So for example, if you're purchasing at 500,000, your minimum down payment could be as low as $25,000. But if you wanted a $600,000 property, it would be then $35,000 would be your minimum down payment. The second basket we have here is a temporary resident, which would usually be somebody who's on a work visa or a student visa, somebody who's in Canada for a temporary amount of time or who is working towards their permanent residency in Canada as well. Um, this person must have verifiable income, so you must be taxed in Canada, you must work for a reputable company, um, and there are certain programs that will allow you to go in with as little as 10% down, but if you are a temporary resident, I would um, err on the side of caution and make sure you have at least 20% down to put into that property. Having net worth and higher assets as well, as far as maybe having 12 months worth of mortgage payments saved up that you're keeping in your bank account, also strengthens your profile as a borrower. So just keep that in mind if, if you fall into that basket. And the last one is somebody who's a non-resident, so somebody who's not working in Canada, maybe just visiting family in Canada, but who doesn't live or work in Canada. Um, and for somebody like that, you will need at least 35% down payment. Again, having a year's worth of payments saved up is going to strengthen your profile um, and working for a reputable company is a big must in this case if you're somebody who's living in a different country and is self-employed or owns their own business it, it's going to be very very difficult to qualify so the reputation of the company that you work for in that situation is going to be very important so jake uh, um you know we are here to often help people you know, get their citizenship and get permanent residence, but it could take a while to get to that situation. Normally what we, uh, you know, a lot of people are in Canada right now on work permits or with study permits. Um, so let, let's just talk about that uh, for a minute. If someone is here as a, an international student, they themselves may not be working in a full-time job because they can't as an international student in that time uh what uh you know but they may have family support now what happens in that situation 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so when we get to income and credit, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. But as somebody who's uh, on a student visa or studying and working part time, to be able to use your income to qualify, you need to have a two year history of working. So you need to be working part time for at least two years in Canada. Um, and the other thing I would really stress is even if you are here as a student, start your credit as early as possible, even if that means getting a credit card with a, a low limit like $500 or $1,000, I would highly, highly recommend get that credit card, use it for your groceries, use it for, you know, your smaller purchases, use it regularly, but be very, very diligent in paying it on time as well. Um, because even if you are a student who's new to Canada and you might be looking to purchase two or three or four years down the road, getting your credit started early is very, very important. And getting a couple years of that part-time work under your belt is, is also very important. Okay, so they can actually start doing things even though they're not you know, earning a very high income, they can start doing some things to help them later on. Well, that's, that's great to know. Yeah. Um, start that credit early and, and start your savings as well. Start accumulating a little bit of a, of a net worth in your bank account. Very important. Is that the same thing for workers as well? If they've just come to Canada and they're working, is it, is it more worth it for them to start working for a while before? Uh, yes. To Definitely. Yeah. It depends on the type of position they have, whether they're an hourly worker or a salaried worker. And I'll get into that a little bit more when we get to the income section. Um, but I would highly stress starting your credit early. And of course, you know, saving as much as you can, um, investing it wisely so that you do have, you know, your money is making money for you while you're waiting and getting to that position where you're ready to buy. So definitely um, get started as early as possible. Okay, but what if they they have parents, for example, who do earn um, a good income, and who might be willing to co-sign with them? Does that make a difference? Definitely, um, co-signers are a big part of of first time buying. Um, I know I work with a lot of first time buyers, and a lot of my clients do have help from their parents, whether it's gifted down payment or whether it is them co-signing. Um, on the purchase. So definitely having parents who are living and working in taxed in Canada, who make good income, who don't have too many debts themselves, um, that's a very a good asset to have somebody you can add to your file and add a lot of strength to the file. Okay. But if their parents are not in Canada, their parents are non-residents, does co-signing make sense at all? No, unfortunately not. If the parents are not residents, they don't add a lot of strength to the file. What I would recommend in that case is to arrange to have gifted down payment. They may not be able to help you by co-signing on the file, but they may be able to help you by sending you money in the form of a gift that you can use towards the down payment, which can then put you a little bit further ahead in your purchasing process. And I'll talk about gifted down payment uh, in, in a couple of slides here too. Okay, fantastic. That's great to know. Perfect. Okay, so next up we have income. I'm going to briefly talk about uh, four types of income here that may be relevant to people who are newer to Canada. Uh, basically, salaried is somebody who's paid based on a yearly amount. So your first job in Canada, your salary is $60,000 a year, $70,000 a year. You're getting uh, pay stubs, and those pay stubs show the deductions for your EI, your CPP, uh, the normal tax deductions in Canada. That's a salary position. And this is the best position to have when you're looking to borrow um, because essentially you can qualify for a mortgage immediately. You don't need to have a two year work history if you're a salaried employee. As long as you're not within a probationary period, which usually for most jobs is three months, sometimes six months. Um, if even if you are within the probationary period, sometimes a lender can grant you an exception to be able to use your income. But essentially, somebody who's a salaried employee is in the best position to borrow, and they can borrow right away. All we require is a job letter from the employer uh, stating the details of their employment and a most recent pay stub that substantiates their, their salary. With somebody who's an hourly employee, so that's you get paid based on the hours per week that you work or the hours that you work uh, every two weeks. Um, and for those kinds of positions, we likely need a two year history. So if you're an hourly employee and you say you work at a manufacturing plant or something like that, and you're, you're paid based on the number of hours and you're paid $25 an hour or whatever the case is, um, we would usually need a two year history for that position unless you are guaranteed the number of hours. So if you are guaranteed 35 hours per week or 40 hours per week, then you don't need a two year work history. But if you're not guaranteed those hours and you just kind of pick up shifts as they come up or you work a little bit of overtime here and there, we would likely need to have a two year history for an employee in that situation. 
Um, another important one I, I decided to address here is contracted work. I know a lot of newer Canadians are under contract, um, which essentially is just an employment agreement that is negotiated and it's for six months, 12 months, two years, depending on your industry. I know a lot of people who are in the IT industry and first come to Canada usually start in a contracted position. Um, and this can be a tougher one because they do require a two year history in most cases for somebody who's on contract work. Um, and it's very important that the contract is renewable as well. Um, not that it's going to be terminated at the end of the contract, but that it's always up for renewal at the end of the contract. Um, so that's very important to consider there. And the last, my last part I wanted to address here is part-time work. So um, like we talked about before with a student who's working part-time or maybe somebody comes to Canada and they're searching for that salaried position, but in the meantime, they're doing part-time work to be able to qualify them for a mortgage. We need to have um, a two-year history again. Usually uh, part-time work is, is defined by working less than 35 hours per week. Um, again, if you have these hours guaranteed, so maybe you're guaranteed 15 hours a week or guaranteed 20 hours a week, we can use that without having a two-year history. But if there's no guarantee of hours, and again, you're just kind of picking up shifts here and there, we do need a two-year history to be able to qualify you on that kind of income. So Jacob, what about if you're self-employed? Does that work at all? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, when in doubt, it's a two-year average. So definitely somebody who's self-employed, we need to use a two-year average. Um, and if you would like a prime rate mortgage, so the mortgage with the lowest interest rate, you're going to have to be qualified based on your declared income. So say you own a company and your company has a revenue of $100,000, but you're only paying yourself $20,000 a year out of that $100,000 revenue. The the lender is only going to qualify you based on that $20,000. Now, there are other lenders. We call them alternative lenders or B lenders. Um, their interest rates are a little bit higher than the prime rate lenders, and they do require a fee as well on funding of the mortgage. So they're a little bit more expensive, but they will look at your company's revenue as opposed to your declared income or your net income. So um, it is a slightly more expensive uh, solution. But for somebody like myself, for example, a mortgage broker who's commission-based, I might be able to go with the B lender and still save money because I'm not paying so much in income tax, declaring less but qualified based on my business's uh, total revenue. So for some people, it, it works out better and it can be cheaper. Uh, it definitely requires going into more detail about their revenue and that kind of thing. So if anybody's in that situation, definitely reach out and, and we can talk about it in more detail. Um, and when we're talking about self-employed, uh, how is that defined? If someone owns part of a company, but not the majority shares of a company. Is that, is, are they still self-employed or? Yes, so technically anybody who has ownership in the company from which they're being paid, they are technically self-employed. Um, the reasoning behind that is that because we'll require a job letter and then essentially they could be signing their own job letter and that creates a conflict of interest that lenders usually aren't very happy with. Um, so yeah, if you have any ownership in a company from which you are drawing a salary or dividends or um, anything like that, it's, it is technically self-employed, yeah. Okay. Great to know. Perfect. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about here very briefly is down payment. So again, down payment is the money that you have saved up that you're putting into the equity of the purchase of your property. Um, like I mentioned earlier, if you're a permanent resident or citizen, you can go in with as little as 5%. Um, but down payment can be uh, taken from a number of sources. Uh, the first box here I have is Canadian savings. So that's money that you've accumulated while working in Canada. You put them away in a TFSA, um, in an RRSP. Just a quick side note, as a first time buyer, you can withdraw $35,000 from your RRSP tax-free um, to work, put towards your down payment. It's just one of the few uh, uh, benefits we have for first time buyers here in Ontario. Um, and so Canadian savings will require a 90 day bank account transaction history uh, showing that you've accumulated that sa those savings in uh, a way that doesn't require any money laundering um, guidelines. So essentially the lenders in Canada are very, very strict with how they look at the down payment that's going into the property. They wanna make sure that it's clean money, that it's money that's coming from reputable sources. Um, and so they will require usually 90 day history um, and some other paperwork in order to verify that. The second box I have here is funds from overseas. So understandably, new Canadians may have money coming from the country from which they emigrated. 
Um, and that can be, you know, money from a property that they that you've sold back in your home country and you're bringing into Canada. Uh, basic rule of thumb is that that kind of money needs to be in a Canadian account for at least 30 days. Um, I would recommend even 90 days to to alleviate some of the paperwork that you're going to have to go through. Um, just bring it over. If you know you're going to start looking for a property, bring the money over um, in whatever way that you can um, and, and keep it in your Canadian institution for at least 30 days. I would recommend 90 days. Um, to be honest, a uh, quick note, the money can't be wired directly to the lawyer on closing. Um, it needs to be in that Canadian institution. And they may ask for some uh, paper trails from the, the, the wire from your home country or uh, even bank statements from the account um, from the country from which the money came. So just make sure to be aware of that if you're bringing in money from overseas. Um, in the last box here, as I mentioned earlier, uh, gifted money from family. So a lot of first time buyers do need help from their family. Um, if it's coming from overseas, again, make sure it's in an, a Canadian account for at least 30 days. If it's coming from a family member that's already living in Canada, that's even better. Um, they just require a gift letter that's signed. Um, every lender has their own template for a gift lender, the gift letter. So if you get to that point, I'll provide you with the gift letter and then the gifter, the person sending the money just has to sign it. And we have to see that the money's been deposited into your account. So not too many hoops to jump through uh, with the gift. And uh, again, understandably, it's, it's a way for new Canadians and first time buyers to, to get ahead and, and make their purchase uh, sooner rather than later. Yeah, I, and I, I must say, you know, Canada has very strict anti-money laundering uh, guidelines right now. And so before you start transferring money uh, and, and et cetera, it's always good to speak to someone like Jacob who can tell you whether what you're doing would be accepted by the Canadian banks. Okay. Absolutely. It's a great point because the last thing I want is for you to come to me and say I'm ready to buy a home and then I start looking through the bank statements and there's stuff going on that just can't be erased, right? What's there is there, what's done is done, and we're going to have to work around it. So the sooner we get in touch and the sooner I can kind of coach you um, on how to move that money around and, and the timing in which to do so, the better. Perfect. Uh, and the last point I wanted to talk about here is credit. As I said earlier, credit is the most important part of your file. Um, obviously, income is important and down payment is important. But if you don't have credit, there's no way that a lender is going to lend money to you. And essentially, the reason behind that is that the lender wants to see that you have credit worthiness, that you are good at handling borrowed money, that you're good at repaying it on time. Um, that is really the most important. And the more credit and the longer credit history you have, the better. So my first suggestion here is start early. As we mentioned earlier, even if you are a student or a temporary resident, uh, apply for that credit card, even if it is a, a low limit and use it as regularly as possible. And my second point there, um, use it for groceries, use it for the smaller purchases. Even if you think that, that um, it may be silly to use your credit card you know, for a $20 grocery purchase or whatever, use it because the more regularly you use it, the, the thicker your credit history becomes and the more credit worthiness you have. Um, it's important to educate on credit because I know different countries have different um, attitudes towards credit. Um, and so I just want to help educate as to how the Canadian government and Canadian lenders look at credit um, just to put you in the best position possible uh, to, to buy your first home. Um, and the last point there, uh, it may seem obvious, but please pay, pay on time. Uh, make your minimum payments, at least minimum payments on time. Um, if possible, pay the entire balance of your credit card or line of credit. Um, every month so that you're bringing it down to zero and then racking it up again the next month and just be diligent about paying it on time because that's very, very important. Any one missed payment or one little blip on your credit report um, will deter a lender from lending you uh, that kind of money, especially because we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars. So uh, definitely make sure you're, you're paying it on time. Just a couple uh, last points here, uh, just for your information, uh, Canadian credit includes credit cards and a personal line of credit. Uh, car loans are another important one, um, or student loans as well do count towards uh, your credit worthiness, obviously, as long as you're paying them on time. Uh, if a student loan is not in repayment yet and you're not paying it back, again, that's not nothing you can do anything about in that situation, but it is good to have that credit facility on your credit bureau. And the last thing I wanted to make a point of, uh, because I do run into this sometimes where somebody who's new to Canada and has a spouse, maybe the spouse isn't working, um, and um, but they, the spouse will have to be on title of the purchase. A lot of people ask me, look, why can't I just be the on title as you know the, the main income earner of the household? Um, in a lot of cases, the lender will require the spouse to be on title, be on the mortgage, 
um, because the lender's attitude is, why isn't the spouse on title? You guys are married. This is your matrimonial home. Um, and they, you know, they think of what's the worst case scenario. Maybe the spouse is hiding something. Maybe their spouse has terrible credit and they don't want to be on the mortgage because the spouse has terrible credit. But in a lot of cases, the spouse just has no credit because maybe the spouse didn't um, is not in a position to want to have a credit card and the main income earner does all of the financial work for the household. Um, I would highly recommend, even if your spouse isn't working, have them get a, a credit card with a small limit, maybe put them on as a joint uh, borrower on, the, on your car loan or something like that, just so your spouse has a little bit of credit. It will make the process so much easier um, when you're purchasing your first uh, home for yourself, for your family. Now, uh, when you define spouse, is it just married uh, couples or what about common law? Uh, yeah, couples. common law as well. Common law and married couples. It, it, and the most you... important is when there's dependents involved. So when you do have children um, and, you're bring, and you're clearly buying the matrimonial home for your family, uh, they really want that both um, adults in, in the relationship to be on title on the mortgage. And so when they both have at least a little bit of credit history, it makes them it much easier. So in the immigration definition of common law, um, it's a couple who have resided together for one year. What's the definition for the banks? Uh, it is one year, yes. Some of them will look at six months as well, um, but, but one year is, is usually the standard, yeah. Okay. Now, what about uh, foreign uh, credit history? Is that considered at all? Yeah, that's a great uh, point. And I actually should have put it on this page here. So if you're in a situation where you have less than two years of active credit on your credit bureau, um, a lender will still consider borrowing to you, but they may require an alternative credit history. Um, so this can be a, a letter from your bank back home saying that you are in good standing, that you had credit with them, that you always paid it back on time or that you had you know, assets in the bank. Um, there, there's other alternate forms of credit where you can show your rent payments that you've paid where you're currently renting 12 months worth of rent payments paid on time every month is, is good to show. Uh, cell phone bills even that you've paid on time every month or utilities. So if you pay utilities at the place that you live um, paid on time every month. So there are alternative forms of credit that you can provide if you do have less than two years of active credit. But that benchmark two years, 24 months of active credit is really the gold standard. If you do have that, you shouldn't be worried about uh, the lender having issue with your credit, of course, making sure that everything is paid on time is very important, but that 24 month benchmark is, is important. If you don't have that, again, those alternative forms of credit can be employed, um, whether it's an international credit bureau showing your credit worthiness from back home, again, a letter from your bank or possibly rent payments that you've paid over the last year on time. Okay, perfect. Well, that's great to know. Um, and is there anything else that you would like to uh, let us know? No, just my last slide here is uh, my contact information. Uh, that's me. I work with uh, SafeBridge Financial, as Elizabeth mentioned. My email, my phone number is there. Uh, I'm sure Elizabeth will be able to share that as well. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm always available. Um, it's always good to start early, even if you are a few years down the road from making that purchase. Planning ahead is, is very, very important. And I'm happy to have that initial conversation and make sure that you're on the right path to uh, being a first-time buyer. Thank you so much, Jacob. I think some of the lessons that I've really learned from your presentation is A, uh, start credit history early and make sure you have good credit history, pay off your bills for sure, yeah. right? Um, and also there are different kinds of things that we can do. I didn't know that there were so many different ways that you could um, you know, get uh, your financial history or build um, or have been a down payment payment, etc. So that that was uh, very important. And then status is, is really, really important as well. Your immigration status, um, you know, leads to your being able to buy. Uh, so, um, you know, let us know, let me know if you have any questions about your immigration situation. And let Jacob know if you plan to buy a house. Okay, great to see you all. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.